I have forgotten at this point exactly when we started having Brother Dub close out our lectures, but it's been a few years ago. I think it's good that we can have him do that. Brother Dub and Sister Ravon, as all here know, have been true servants in the kingdom of the Lord. And we certainly appreciate the exemplary life, the exemplary life that they've lived in good and bad times, and they come to us all. We appreciate so many of you here for that reason. But Mother McLeish, who is a native Texan, gospel preacher, son-in-law of a gospel preacher, Brother B.B. James, who's a long-time preacher, he's been dead a number of years now. He is uh, father of a gospel preacher. I think we know who that is, Brother Well, I was looking here at the other, I can't find your other son. <laughs> no, I got Andy. Um, Hal, that's right. I had it knotted down here. It is. I just can't see it. It's getting late. And his brother Andy, I was trying to say, who was the, is the gospel preacher. He has seven grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. And uh, to sum it all up, he has been educated. <laughs> He has, uh, he's been a located preacher. He's somewhat dislocated now. He does evangelistic work. We're glad to have a part here as he works under the oversight of these elders. And we want to hear him preach the gospel tonight on a very fitting subject that affects the church and will keep the church either going down a good way or a bad way. The elders and deacons responsibility to keep the unity of the spirit. The dove, please come preach to us. Thank you, David, for those uh, kind comments. <clears throat> I'm especially glad that LeVon could come with me this year. I was afraid that some of you might think that uh, I really didn't have a wife anymore. She <laughs> has uh, not been with me down here for uh, a number of years, but uh, she has a lot of health issues, as many of you know, and uh, unfortunately, they're not very good health issues. But uh, she was determined to come this year and I'm so glad that she did, and she's uh, held up pretty well. It's a delight to come spring because uh, I know what I'll find when I get here every year, and I know what uh, is here year-round. And uh, we always delight in staying with Buddy and Burnell, and they treat us like family, and uh, we can really relax at their house, and we appreciate that so much. And my thanks to the elders here for their great help in our work that we uh, try to do. If you're ever in the Denton area, we'd like for you to stop in with the uh, North Point congregation. We have eight members, and uh, I guarantee you, you would be noticed if you <laughs> stop and visit with us. <laughs> I preach there every uh, Lord's Day that I'm in town and uh, frequently teach our Bible classes there. We're doing our best to get the word out there. We have a gospel meeting coming up in April, Lord willing, for the Don Party will be doing the preaching for us then. Well, David Brown preached in our meeting last year. Brother Lee Moses preached in our meeting the week of the year before that. So we are uh, continuing to try to sow the seed, get the word out and uh, do our best to find honest and good hearts who will study the Word of God with us. I appreciate so much for the Lee Moses who spoke the last hour because of the uh, development we've seen in Lee over the years. We've seen him from ground zero to where he is now. And I know it's a thrill to Gary and Barbara to see that same thing. Uh, Lee not only uh, was converted while at Pearl Street, but he found his wife who was also converted after she came to Pearl Street. And so there's a real story there. They have twin boys and a baby girl. And uh, he's doing wonderful work. They are in Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. Lord willing, I'll be with them in April in a meeting. And Lord willing, Saturday night, Lee will be with Gary and Barbara in Florida 
Pentecostal meeting that begins. So uh, we cherish those connections. It's almost been uh, Pearl Street Day here in the spring today and tonight. I want to begin tonight by uh, <clears throat> reading my assignment from Brother David Brown. Dub, I would like you to address the topic, elders and deacons' responsibility to propagate and keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If you need more than the allotted 16 pages, feel free to take more pages. In general, please cover what elders owe the church and what the church owes faithful elders. How the church appoints elders and deals with unqualified slash unfaithful elders. Keep in mind the elder R and R. Also strongly emphasize the responsibility of elders to keep the church pure, lead the church in the practice of church discipline, preventive and corrective, especially corrective discipline. The elders' responsibility of being mouth stoppers to false teachers, of keeping the church informed regarding current <laughs> Regarding current events in the church, the work of deacons under faithful elders, elders slash deacons relationship, how each can help the other keep scriptural unity of the church. The, I'm not through yet. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of keeping faithful preachers in the pulpit and faithful teachers in the classrooms, upholding the hands of faithful preachers and faithful members, knowing what the work of the preacher is etc. <laughs> Further, how the elders have a great responsibility to recognize missionary societies, benevolent societies, and other parachurch organizations, <clears throat> etc. <laughs> if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> I wrote him back and I said, is there anything else you'd like me to cover <laughs> on elders and deacons? And uh, he wrote me back and he said, do you want to cover more? <laughs> I said, my question was obviously a failed attempt at humor. <laughs> when it takes a half page to describe the contents of the topic, you know it's going to be a long manuscript. <laughs> And it is. And so if you want to know what I wrote, you won't hear it tonight. <laughs> the, the half will not be told, I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, that's a book assignment, not a chapter assignment. But I'm glad to have the opportunity to address this subject for a few minutes anyway. It is a most important subject. Paul addressed the Ephesian elders as we have the record in Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. Some two or three years after that, he addressed his Ephesian letter to the church in Ephesus. In the fourth chapter, in verse 3, is where we have that exhortation we've heard so many times this week, to give diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit and bond of peace, followed by the seven ones. One of the things that Paul told the elders when he met with them at Miletus, verse 28, was to take heed to yourself and then to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit made you bishops to feed the church of the Lord which he has purchased with his own blood. Doubtless, when Paul sent that letter to the Ephesians, it went first to the hands of the elders. What do you think after hearing Paul's addressed to them at Miletus, they first thought about doing with the contents of that letter. It was to apply to themselves. Take heed unto yourselves, Paul said to the elders. When they got the Ephesian epistle, surely they understood that they must apply it first to themselves. Therefore, Ephesians 4.3 had its primary application, I believe, to the elders. Their God-given responsibility to do their best to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It was not just any kind of unity that Paul said that they were to keep and we are to keep, but the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That doesn't mean a spirit of unity. 
but it means a unity provoked by and produced by the Spirit. That is, a unity that is prescribed by what the Holy Spirit teaches. God does not prescribe just any and every kind of unity. The unity he prescribes is a qualified unity, therefore. There is some unity that God forbids. There is some division that God demands. And we have no right to change either of those. We need clearly then to understand which he prescribes and which he forbids. We learn that from studying what the Holy Spirit teaches us. The unity of the Spirit is. We're not going to have time tonight to study much about deacons. We're not going to have time to study the qualifications of elders. That's well beyond the scope of our study, and I did not even include a study of the qualifications in my manuscript. But I'll mention two or three things about those qualifications. In the first place, Men who are to serve as elders are not just men who can be picked up off of the pew or off of the street. They are men who have to have certain qualifications that have given them certain preparation for the work that God gives them to do through the Holy Spirit's dictates. Those qualifications are not just arbitrary. They have to do practically with the work that elders have the responsibility of performing in the church of the Lord. Even if they were just arbitrary, they would still be mandatory. But they are not arbitrary. And men who are appointed without these qualifications will never measure up to the work that God has given them to do. Sometimes men who have the qualifications do not measure up, but they certainly will not measure up if they fail the qualifications. These qualifications must be present in the men before they're appointed. We cannot appoint men whom we believe are good men and hope they will grow into these qualifications. Paul said specifically of the deacons, 1 Timothy 3, 13, following their qualifications, let them first be proved and then let them be appointed. The same thing is implied, though not stated explicitly, concerning elders as well. When we think of the qualifications of elders, each elder must have each qualification. I've heard the theory, perhaps you have, that as long as we have all the qualifications present in the aggregate of the eldership, that suffices. But no, it's not so. The word must is either present or implied before each qualification, and each qualification pertains to each man. And so the qualifications apply in that way. The unity which we are talking about tonight, and which we are to earnestly endeavor to keep, is a unity in which elders are a very primary part. There is no unity of conscience or practice necessary on certain things. We call these optional things. Romans chapter 14, Paul discusses those who are non-meat eaters and meat eaters. We call them vegetarians and meat eaters today. And he says it doesn't make a bit of difference to God whether you eat meat or whether you eat vegetables or whether you eat both of them. Romans 14, verse 3. And in chapter 15, still discussing the same thing, verse 7, he says, Receive you one another concerning such matters. There is no unity that elders or anybody else must have or must try to keep among the saints on such matters. When we get to the 8th chapter and the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives somewhat the same instructions about eating meats offered to idols. Not wrong in and of itself, though it can be made wrong. 
These are optional matters. We can have differences of opinions about such things. And there are numerous things in the Church of the Lord today, though we don't have a problem with eating meat offered to idols in our culture, about which we can have differing opinions. We have all kinds of options in carrying out God's obligations upon us. What time to meet on the Lord's Day? How many cups we shall have in the communion? And uh, many, many other things. Paul and Barnabas had a strong disagreement about whether or not to take John Mark with them on their second preaching trip. And yet, they did not let that destroy their unity. Obviously, their disagreement was in a matter that was optional. Now, that's unity and diversity, Brett. That's biblical unity and diversity. We are to be diverse and allow one another to be diverse in such optional matters. Now, the exception to that is where elders have made a decision in the congregation on optional matters, and then we're to submit to the elders in those optional matters. But otherwise, there is room for diversity, and still we maintain unity in such matters. But the other part of that is the unity that is mandatory, where God has spoken, where he has made matters obligatory upon the church, there are no options. The only option is conformity. And that's what 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 addresses. Paul is not discussing matters that we can have disagreements over and still be one in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. When he says there be no divisions among you, you all speak the same thing, you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. He is talking about obligatory matters, matters that God has specified and men have no options concerning except to how to carry them out. And in those matters, we cannot have unity and diversity, and elders must be made to understand the difference between the optional and the obligatory. When we think about the qualifications of elders, and principles relating to qualifications of elders, it brings up the matter of the appointment of elders. God has not specified what ceremony, if we want to call it that, we are to use in appointing elders. But obviously there has to be something when men have been selected and when they are shown to be qualified that distinguishes them from being at point A, a non-elder, to point B, being an elder. And so generally, brethren have uh, come up with a time when the qualifications have been studied and the men's names have been submitted and uh, questions have been asked, does anyone know of a disqualification? And these men remain where we say, these men will now be our elders and the congregation submits to them. Now what about when a man becomes disqualified as an elder? Not only are men not to be appointed who do not meet the qualifications, but men who meet the qualifications originally can disqualify themselves after being appointed. And men should no longer, no more be able to serve after they are disqualified while serving as elders than they should have been appointed in the first place without the qualifications. There are some who are saying, that we have to have a reaffirmation, a reconfirmation, a reevaluation of men to get rid of such elders, disqualified elders. They say the Bible does not specify how to get rid of disqualified elders. They, of course, are wrong. All dealt with that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. He said, them that sin rebuke before all after there have been charges sustained by two or three witnesses against an elder. His fellow elder or elders should take care of the disqualified elder. But if they will not, the congregation that appointed them as elders should disappoint them as elders. Disqualified men should not serve, either from the beginning or after the fact. There are several things about the Elder Reaffirmation Program that have been discussed this week. 
none of which can be found in 1 Timothy 5, 19, 20, or anywhere else in the Bible. You will not find any arbitrary percentage of how many votes a man must get to be retained as an elder. You will not find any uh, selection or administrative committee that's placed between an existing eldership and the congregation to try to disqualify or unseat a serving elder. You will not find any of the machinery that's involved in the elder reaffirmation program. You will certainly not find anything in the New Testament whereby, upon a certain percentage, a man may be retained in the eldership who is disqualified or a man who may be dismissed from the eldership when he is still qualified. The elder reaffirmation thing fails on every point. When we think about uh, elders, their qualifications, their disqualifications, we think about one principal source of the elder reaffirmation program. Until 1990, I don't know of any congregation that was considered a sound or faithful congregation that had ever used this procedure for replacing elders or retaining elders. It was in that year that the Brown Trail Church in Bedford, Texas, used this program. Now, we have placed a lot of blame on Brother Dave Miller for doing this, and he deserves all that he's getting. But, brother, we need to remember that that would never have happened if the elders that were there had not approved that. The fault lies with the eldership, first of all. Brother Dave Miller did not have to submit to the elders in that case because they were in violation of the will of God. Elders cannot overrule what God's Word says, although some seem to think they can. One of the excuses Brother Miller has used is that it had the full backing and approval of the elders to execute this program. Well, so what? Women preachers do some places. The elders approve women preachers some places. Women elders some places. All kinds of unscriptural things are approved by elders in some places. That says nothing about whether it's right or wrong, except what the scriptures say about it. And so the fault lies primarily with the eldership that that was ever done in the first place, and then that it was ever done in the second place in 2002. When we think of elders, the dismissal of elders, the appointment of elders, things of that kind, we need to understand, brethren, that there's no more crucial time in the life of any congregation than when it selects and appoints elders. Because that is going to determine the course of that congregation for no telling how many years. And so we cannot be too careful at the time of that appointment. What about the authority of elders? I did not begin hearing any objections to the authority of elders in a local congregation until sometime in the 1960s, I guess. The Rural Lemons, the editor of the Firm Foundation, in the 1970s and 80s made himself the champion of anti-authority uh, elders. He wrote a, an editorial that has become rather uh, well known called Who Calls the Shots, 1977 Firm Foundation. Among other things, he uh, argued in that article that elders do not even have the right to have an elders meeting. That every decision about a congregation has to be a congregational decision. I responded to that article, and to Brother Lemon's credit, he uh, printed my article in the Firm Foundation, all the while commenting editorially that I missed his point. The problem was I hit his point, and he didn't like it. But I argued from the seven Greek words that are used to describe elders in the New Testament, 
that every one of them is authority laden. I pointed out that he preached for a congregation that had elders who decided how much to pay him and who to get to preach when he was gone. I pointed out that he regularly preached in gospel meetings in congregations where elders had met and decided to invite him to come, and he had no problem doing that. I pointed out that in an editorial not long before his Who Calls the Shots editorial, he had urged elderships to invite missionaries in to make their appeals for bonds. And of course, he would always welcome subscriptions from congregations where elders had decided to subscribe to the firm foundation. Brethren, elders have authority in a local congregation that's given them of God. We are to submit ourselves to those who have the rule over us and to submit to them, obey them. Hebrews 13, verse 17. When Paul gave his charge to the Ephesian elders and told them to take heed unto themselves to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made them bishops or overseers. He was giving elders authority over the local congregation. Now some elders I have met through the years and have tried to work with had the idea that any one elder had the authority of the eldership just speaking by himself. Now if elders delegate one of themselves to deliver a message of some kind that the eldership has decided on, that's one thing. But for an elder to go out and freelance and say this or that or the other just on his own, that's a different thing. I had an elder one time in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama in 1963, I guess it was, to tell me that I could not preach longer than 20 minutes at a time. And I immediately said, is that the decision of the eldership or your private opinion, Brother Quinn? Of course, I knew the answer before I asked him. But I kept on preaching my 45-minute sermons. <laughs> the authority is in the eldership, not in any one single elder is the point. There's a congregational pattern concerning elders. It is never one elder over one church, one elder over more than one church, more than one elder over more than one church, but always more than one elder over one church. And we dare not deviate from that. Anything deviating from that destroys God's pattern of organization for his church. Now let's look at some illustrations of uh, delinquent elders and division. I really believe that so much of the apostasy that has taken place over the last 40 years must be laid at the feet of elderships. And I know that there are good and godly men who serve as elders and who have served as elders through all the years of the church's existence some of which who still serve today, some of them are in this building, but at the same time, when we think of the terrible apostasy that's taken place and of the terrible division that has occurred over the past two and a half years, we have to trace it back to elders, basically. Elders must realize that the buck stops with them. Some of them, when the buck gets there, they pass it on or they shoot it. <laughs> and they don't deal with what must be dealt with. They don't respect the Word of God in their responsibilities. I believe that the corruption in the universities that brethren operate can be traced back to the fault of elderships. If elderships, as one, had set their feet down and said, we're not going to send any young people to you, we're not going to announce your lectureships, we're not going to have anything to do with you unless you stay true to the word or until you clean up your act, that would have had a great and good effect, I believe. 
same thing is true of, of any program of that sort among our brethren. How many preachers have been retained in pulpits by elders, men who should have been sent packing long ago because they would not preach the whole counsel of God or they preached far more than the counsel of God. And yet they've been allowed to stay there. Food has been put on their table by those congregations and they've corrupted those congregations. Time after time after time and hundreds if not thousands of congregations have been lost because liberal men have been kept in the pulpits by elders who either were too ignorant, too lazy, or too materialistic, or whatever. It doesn't make any difference what the cause was. They failed in their responsibilities. The fault lies with elders in those matters. And the current problems that we are experiencing, elderships have played a primary part, I believe. If the church is to be kept pure, it will be kept pure because of elderships who continue to strive diligently to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If fellowship is transgressed, if biblical unity is cast aside, it will be because elderships were derelict in their duty. We've already mentioned the Brown Troy situation. It comes back to the eldership who allowed that to happen, not once, but twice. The Pearl Street Church is a study in the very same thing. The problem there that destroyed that congregation for all practical purposes had to do with one man in the eldership who told the rest of us elders that he agreed with Mac Deaver's heresies. Gary Summers and I worked for a year and a half trying to forestall what we saw and what we knew would be the terrible destruction that would take place if we could not either get that brother to repent or to resign or both. Unfortunately, we had two other elders who sat quietly during all of the discussions that we had with this erring brother. And finally, the cause was lost, and Gary and I both left in spring of 2003. The other two elders joined the errant elder. You may remember that when the word got out that we had an elder at Pearl Street, a congregation that had been known all over the world for its faithfulness for over 20 years, mainly through the Denton Lectures, but when the word got out that we had a MacDever elder and that the other elders had joined him and that Gary and I had had to leave, they denied vociferously in print more than once that they agreed with MacDever or they even called it the MacDever errors and MacDever doctrine. A few people were converted <coughs> when they saw the Pearl Street church, male, biblical notes quarterly in the spring of 2004 for MacDeeper. And then any remaining skeptics were surely converted when they hired MacDeeper to be their preacher in August of 2005. That congregation no longer meets at Pearl Street. And with some poetic justice, I think, they bought a small Nazarene building out in the end of town where I live. You may know that the Nazarenes are the most Wesleyan of any religious group, and Mac Deaver's doctrine is basically Wesleyan doctrine. So we've got some poetic justice there, I guess. Why did that occur? It occurred because elders failed. It was at the feet of the elders. Think about other congregations involved in the strife that's among us today. Think about the Forest Hill elders. In June of 1998, I drove down to this lectureship. You were still having in June then, obviously. 
And then I flew to Memphis to speak at the graduation exercise of Memphis School of Preaching. Then flew back that same day for the lectureship here. One thing I told those graduates and the elders of the Forest Hill congregation was how much was depending upon that eldership. I said, you have this beautiful new facility. You have a great school. You're turning out a wonderful product. I encourage them in every way. But I said, brethren, elders can go astray too. This church and this school depend upon you elders. I was not trying to be prophetic. And I did not want to be prophetic, but I fear that I was. Those men now have given their approval and backing and support to a faculty that is endorsing, defending, and supporting a false teacher and the institution that he heads. They are supporting a man in the pulpit who is one of the biggest promoters of Brother Dave Miller and Apologetics Press, Brother Barry Greider. He comes back to the elders. Then there's the Dalton, Georgia Highland Church eldership. Those who have the oversight of the Gospel Broadcasting Network. They chose, I think it was sometime in 2004, to use men from Apologetics Press, including Brother Dave Miller. And when the neighboring congregation, just about uh, 20 miles down the road from them, Northside Church in Calhoun, Georgia, its elders wrote and asked them some questions, raised some questions about Brother Dave Miller, cheaply because Dave had come to their city in 1999 and given solace and comfort and endorsement and bid God's speed to the liberal church there in Calhoun. The thing finally developed to the point where the Highland elders in Dalton withdrew fellowship from the elders, not the preacher or the members, they made that very clear, but the elders of the Highland Church in Calhoun. Well, the effect of that, brethren, whether everybody's understood it or not, but Gary Summers made it very plain in an excellent article he wrote on it, is that when they drew the line against Highland elders, they drew the line against everybody who has a problem with Dave Miller and put everybody on one or the other sides of that line. What does it go back to? It goes back to the elders of the Highland Church in Dalton, Georgia. And what about some other elderships? I think about the elders of the East Hill Church in Pulaski, Tennessee, who can't have a lectureship without Dave Miller on it. I think about the Getwell Church in Memphis, Tennessee, who cannot have a lectureship without Dave Miller on it. And that's been the case for several years. Though they have certain knowledge of it, uh, if from no other source, from this fellow right here, who wrote and told them why he couldn't speak on the lectureship three or four years ago. And uh, what about uh, the East Tennessee School of Preaching lectureship, the Carnes Church? Brother Dave Miller is a fixture on that lectureship. It's eldership after eldership after eldership. If men had stood for the truth, who are serving as elders, if they had not been interested in other things and had loyalties other than to the truth on God's unity and fellowship among his people, this matter would never have reached its proportions. It would have been dried up overnight. And I think elders are going to be the ones who will fix it if it's ever fixed by bringing in men and saying, look, this is the way it's going to be. We are no longer going to support a man who has all of these clouds over his head and who has all of this information documenting his errors until he repents. Someone mentioned earlier today the Palm Beach Lakes Church in West Palm Beach, Florida, that supposedly oversees the Apologetic Press work. Just think what would have happened if they had set their foot there and how that would have cut off so much of what has happened and what has developed. It's eldership after eldership after eldership. 
much mischief has been wrought in the Lord's church because elders passed the buck or didn't even recognize their wash warrant, and they failed. But all is not lost. There are good and godly elders in our world and in the church today. Three of them are right here tonight at spring. The Fred Stancliffe is a part of an eldership of that kind at Bellevue. The brethren here set their feet down a long time ago. These elders did. And like the tree planted by the waters, they had not been moved. The Bellevue elders have been the same. They have the same kind of character. They set their feet down early in this matter. One of those men called Dave Miller, not once, but called him again. He got it straight from the horse's mouth, and I don't mean any uh, uh, reflection upon the horse, I'm not upon Brother Miller by saying that. But regardless of the ties, regardless of the connections, think of the connections the Bellevue Church had with Memphis School of Preaching. Their preacher before Brother Michael Hatcher for several years was Brother Bobby Liddell, now the director of Memphis School of Preaching. Every year, most of the faculty would speak on the Bellevue Lectures. But for men of principle, those things don't matter when truth is at stake. And it was in this case. God give us more men like that and like these here at Spring. Brethren, there are three or four more hours of material I'd like to give you. <laughs> but the time of my departure is at hand. <laughs> I want to close tonight by asking you to get your songbooks out. We have no way of knowing who might be watching or tuned in by the Internet and who may have n never heard the gospel plan of salvation before in their lives, who may never have another opportunity to hear it. I have no idea who all in this auditorium tonight is a Christian or not a Christian. And so we dare not leave this place tonight with anyone not knowing. When we look at the church's beginning on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts 2, we see a gospel sermon preached that brings people to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Peter drew a conclusion in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And there were some in that vast crowd of people who could not take the burden of guilt that had been laid upon them any longer. And so verse 37 says, and they cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That was in itself a confession of their faith in Christ Jesus as the Son of God. Had Billy Graham been there, he would have said, Well, you need do nothing. Just go home and join the church of your choice. Had Max Licato been there, he would have said, You need do nothing. Just go and find a church you like, and you can be baptized if you want to. Calvinist been there, he would have said, you can do nothing. Either you're part of the elect, predestined to be saved, or you can just forget about it. But fortunately, Peter just, poor old Peter, just an apostle of Christ. He didn't know any better. Just a fisherman. He said, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter wasn't through preaching yet. The promise is unto you and to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. And with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then the glorious result is recorded in verse 41. They then that received or gladly received, the King James says, his word were baptized. 
and they were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. Do you think they came on that day with their towels and their changes of clothes rolled up under their arms? Not a one of them had any idea what they were going to hear or what they were going to do among those 3,000 when they came. But they did it anyway because they were convicted of the truth and they were determined to obey it. Listen, brethren and friends, when one gladly receives the word of God, he will not quibble about baptism or anything else God has commanded. And when one quibbles about anything God has commanded, be it baptism or anything else, he hasn't gladly received the word of God. What about you tonight? Have you gladly received the word of God and obeyed him in repentance and baptism upon the confession of your faith? If so, we thank God for you. We encourage you. If you haven't, plead with you to do that. If you're in this building tonight, we can help you with that. If you're watching on the Internet, contact us by means given you through the program. Let some of us help you. If you need to come back as an erring Christian, come while we stand and sing.